Oh, I see. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a team over there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Did, did you have to get out of bed early today? No. Because <laughs> <laughs> he lives in the morning, right? Oh, I was there yesterday. Gorgeous. Love it. Great shopping, arts, culture. It's just got such a great vibe going on. They had some of the highest sunshine hours. Yeah, they did. Nice gardens room. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Mila was having a, um, a smell assessment. Yeah. <laughs> Ciara. Did she serve you at McDonald's? No. Uh, she's finishing year 12. Show me what that is in Form 6. Oh, Emma Humphrey. Oh, no, that's Dean and um, Ann Humphrey's daughter. They live on Mungoni Road. Yeah. John. The late John Humphrey's granddaughter. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah. yeah, no, 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 she left school <laughs> earlier this year and has been doing this. But it's just purely and simply because <laughs> yeah. my niece Hannah and Emma are good friends. That's right. No, no, I didn't know. I did go through um, yeah. places with Ian. They've got the very uh, autistic. Yeah. Yeah, you're, you're moving cycles though, eh, with kids, it's like that. They were prepared to move. To like I used to know from my time in early childhood, there was a period for about 10 years where I not only knew, you know, a huge set of the preschool age group, but I therefore knew the, all the primary school kids too, because, you know, you'd seen them come through. But, it's long, it's long gone. He was really, really, and it's changed a lot. I've noticed over the last year or so because they now you they don't want you in the school grounds unless you have to be. You don't get that same engagement and connection building. Sorry, I think Hamish wants you. Oh, John's hands in. Good morning, Mikey. Sorry, I've been looking to my left. Crikey, Jensen won a few awards, didn't he? Ducks, exceptional this. Look at the rack up. I said you nearly need a toilet to choke this. What's he saying? Well, to the water whispering, because they have to go November, half to start. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, a small one, I think. John's Good morning.
No one just wants to take it. Oh, you can stick my name there if you don't want yours there. Uh, so I'd like to move that the minutes be adopted. Uh, Mr Chair, just following up on my email to you from earlier this week, I did just want to request um, an amendment to the notification of items for next meeting on page nine of the minutes. Just noting, um, it's got that, that I asked about when the procurement policy was scheduled for review as this was overdue, but I was quite explicit at that meeting in requesting it to have come back for this meeting. Yeah, it was requested, uh, just in addition to say that it was requested that the policy be brought back in November. Um, yeah. Sure, and we'll bring that up again under subject to that. Um, amendment. Sorry. Sure. To move, we've got the resolution in front of me, but I can't find it if you want. Mr. Chair, I won't vote, I was pressed. Yes, I have to. Team, he's going to run through. I think if the Ox team come up to the I feel like I'm in table, the Dragon's Den, there's going to be a panel. <laughs> 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 um, I let the guys know that ties are optional. Um, so we'll just have to go up to the sit behind us. Um, so we've got the so just really as part of the wider order of risk function, um, I think we're effectively across the, the deep dive process. Um, we've done it across a range of activities uh, across council over the last 12 months. So this was uh, from the meeting earlier this week, uh, down at the side of the Lasso Equipment Plant, uh, where you met uh, Kieron, uh, and we ended at Adam as well, talking through the, what we do and how we do it um, down the Lasso Plant. So this is the, the formal part of that process to sort of close off um, discussions and then we'll get back to it. And Brooke has a short presentation that he's going to take us through, and then we'll be open for any uh, questions uh, and discussion from him. Thank you. Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, as Hank's was saying, you're pretty up to speed now with how these things work. So um, we'll follow our way through and um, yeah, ask if there's any questions that are not so much. Um, cool. So um, in terms of today, we'll just quickly again just touch on your due diligence requirements and kind of what we do, um, what we're doing at the quarter. Um, talk a bit about the site visit we had, the nature of Operations, um, talk about their health and safety risks, a uh, reminder of the risk process, and then we'll go through those key risks. Um, um, so, acquire and update knowledge on health and safety matters. So, I'm not going to go over all of these points, but as you guys know, it's um, you know, under the Act, have the uh, responsibility. To kind of have an idea of what's going on um, in terms of health and safety with all the kind of And our next one. Um, so just a few snaps there from Monday. So um, 
think Francis was saying is that do a good job of turning on the weather when we have these little um, catch ups. So that was good. Um, and yeah, obviously, big thanks to um, Andrew and here on Kurt who took us around um, a few parts of the farms and talked about uh, some of those that are coming from a good um, basis. And just a few shots here of uh, some of the day-to-day -day operations. Um, I love that photo in the top left looking at it. It's <laughs> like Ministry of Work stuff. How many? <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. Or is that not the person you expect to be when you do it? <laughs> So if somebody gets instructed out, it's probably dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I can confirm that was really staged. Not true, but it's not how it's usually rolled. So the cross And yeah, so just the whole bunch of stuff here. Um, I chucked the picture of the youth because um, we talked a little bit about on Monday and the deep driving involved, um, especially when you think about the fact that um, people are covering the RDC side of it as well. Um, behind John's head, you can't see there's a picture of um, just the deep water. Stuff, and then a picture below that of one of the ponds. Um, so working in and around water is obviously a bit of a hazard in itself. Uh, then we've got the core and gas. So I think that's the Hinatangi uh, water business plant one there. So um, mm -hmm. obviously mm -hmm. we want to be handling that stuff all the right way and have things right close to the place. Mm -hmm. uh, a few bits from one of the region sheds uh, that we are working with. And then in the bottom corner there, um, that one that's Cronin's um, truck bit. So a lot of this as well is um, interacting with contractors and um, things like that. So um, I guess it sort of highlights that while the teams have their own um, risk that they're dealing with, then on top of that, they've got contractors and stuff that they all have to um, keep an eye on as well. So there's a lot going on, and um, definitely one of our high risk sort of teams to operate. Um, so health and safety risks. Um, so here on in the middle there, so he is our MDC uh, health and safety risk for both treatment and retake. Um, and then Mel is on the RDC side with treatment and Aaron on the RDC side with retake. Um, so they did a great job. Um, especially here on Mel, basically every time we go out, um, want to go out and just check the site out or whatever, um, they'll pick me up or whatever and we go out and do that together. So um, yeah, that's much appreciated. Uh, right, risk process reminder. So, again, just quickly over this um, how we uh, the risk that we did the risk matrix stuff with the post it notes, and it's basically uh, bow tie analysis for uh, what the teams um, decided were their top five risks. Today. So these ones are a little, a little bit different to other teams, just obviously get the MDC, RDC side. So the way these teams were done, uh, one with MDC treatment and retic, and then another with RDC treatment and retic. Um, and I think uh, out of the 10 risks that they came up with, five each, um, three from each were the same, and three from each were the same. So um, don't worry, we don't have 10 risks to go through. Um, but from the MDC side, you see, um, Drowning, machinery, confined spaces, traffic, and biohazard type of the five that they came up with. On the RDC side, uh, driving, chemicals, trenches, and then traffic. <coughs> um, the picture of the uh, matrix with all the post bits, there was a lot of risks for them to choose from, so hard uh, to nail it down to five. Um, right, so we'll just flip through these like we usually do. So um, in terms of drowning, they uh, rated that one as a high risk. Um, and the <coughs> potential causes, obviously, what happens to people working around the pond is kind of your, your main one. I'm um, also driving alongside the ponds. So um, I know, especially when I've been out with Kieran a couple of times, we've gone to a site and actually we know it's, if it's been a bit weak or whatever, it's usually safer to get out of the gate and just walk in instead of trying to drive right up around the pond with some of the sites. Um, that end up in a bit of trouble. So the teams are all really sensible about <coughs> that stuff. Um, doing another one there around the member of the public getting into a site. So um, I think Francis 
have some of my later three year old that grounded for a few years ago near um, one of their white ponds. Um, so, you know, the majority of our sites are um, fairly well out in the middle of the nowhere, but they're not really in the middle of the <coughs> There's always water, um, but there is always that risk, and especially as we've um, talked about like the big site here in Fielding with people on their bikes going up long salt banks and stuff like that. So, um, when that new fencing um, goes in, that would be a uh, big for them for sure. Um, e roads is the current control, so just in terms of if somebody's yeah, got the equipment out to a site and we can see that their vehicles will, you know, they haven't come back and we can see their vehicles being there for a long time, um, then we can at least know exactly what site they should be at. And sort of actions to put that bit of site fencing, so that's the DIA funding. Uh, that's the, yeah. <coughs> Uh, machinery, so I think, um, what's the name of that big machine? That's the treatment plant that we were talking about. The sumo screen? Yep, that's the one. So that's the one we talked about quite a bit on Monday. Um, and, you know, um, if you want to check that, it's a overview of, of uh, how it works and uh, how they can turn, turn it off when they're working on it and things like that. So um, there's protocols in place that we have touched on in terms of Training and stuff like that. So, any new stuff and uh, given a lot of training on how all the different things that they need to deal with work. Um, current controls, so obviously, maintenance to keep on top of, and um, stuff like that. So, um, yeah, the machinery that they're using, everything um, seems to work pretty well. And, um, the sites are Find spaces. Um, so for some of the reasons there, leaving the pipe work underground, um, and then again, contractors. So even if we're sending contractors in to find spaces, um, again, if they're our, our sites as such, um, obviously we still have a pretty big responsibility to um, current control. So permits work, um, you know, got a whole bunch of specialists for the PPE, um, breathing apparatus, um, using the harnesses and things like that. So and this is never a task that would be um, carried out with somebody on their right. So, um, again, a whole lot of processes and um, safety stuff around something like that to find space. Traffic. Um, so, I think, yeah, for a retail, this is um, a big one for them. So, and I know a lot of people are, um, uh, like every now and then I find myself going through a, whatever it's a 30 case type zone and look down and shift things a bit quick. So um, it's just really remembering when you go through those zones that actually uh, those are real people on the other side of the site just kind of trying to carry out their jobs. So um, if we follow the rules, it makes it life a lot easier for them. Um, so yeah, some of the things there. In terms of actions underway, um, so just recently, what Kankaki has introduced a new STMS training um, regime, and it's at the moment, uh, most of our guys are still uh, current under the old system, um, but I'm just currently getting my head around how that new system works because it will, um, it's just different really, and um, it is quite confusing. Uh, of the steps and things like that, which uh, they seem to be good at doing that sort of stuff, um, but we'll get there, so uh, probably a big action for me. Uh, Biohazards, so uh, yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Um, it was quite cool the last month, I think, I went uh, with Callum, who's one of the treatment operators over at, uh, working at RDC, um, and we were out at Ratana um, looking at a site there, he had to do something, to be honest, I couldn't see exactly what it was, but um, he had the whole disposable uh, overall type thing going on, completely covered, um, get up there and do what he needs to do, so um, it's probably things like that are the most glorious of jobs. Um, but probably some of the most important jobs that we, we get going on at Council um, Management uh, will be done um, before we get them. Um, so, yeah, current control is just a whole bunch of stuff around us with PPE, having the right arms for PPE, vaccinations, and things like that, and um, just general good hygiene practices. Driving, so this is one that you guys, I think, every, pretty much every group that we've talked to, driving's been one of their um, hazards, and usually it is an extreme risk rating. 
um, for sort of the normal stuff for the SWB, um, in terms of controls for EROs, um, price starts, safety vehicles, um, good maintenance, and things like that. Um, probably this is a good one to touch on the get home safe stuff um, with these guys. It's been a little bit of hit and miss, more so for the fact that um, it's probably not the ideal solution for a team of people who are constantly driving and in places where they're going in and out of coverage and things like that. So you know that if you miss your check in, um, they'll intend to see courses to give you a call. Um, but if you're not in phone coverage, you know, you're not going to call. Um, so I'm doing a little bit of work in the background to see what we can do. Um, but I'm not uh, stressed about it, you might say, because um, having e roads in all of the vehicles um, is a really good basis safety net for us um, that if we're you know worried that somebody hasn't come back or turned up and um, then we can follow up with e-roads and things like that. Very quickly, thank you Chair. Uh, e-roads is hooked up through GPS anyway, isn't it? Yeah. So you've, got, you've actually got that layer there. Definitely. Yep. So the, the added bonus I guess of getting on safe is if somebody's got out of their view and yeah. wanted to do something, um, then it just gives you a bit uh, of a better idea of who they are. But, but yeah, as I say, the reason that I'm not scrambling to try to find a solution now Quickly, um, is that we've got E-Rose, that's um, a good job for us, and I'd rather just actually try to find something that's going to work properly for these guys so they're not having to worry about if they're going to be in and out of reception um, when their time and runs out and things like that. So, um, yeah, a little bit of extra work to do there. Um, actually, on the breaching side too, um, if they're going into um, trenches and things like that, um, a lot of them uh, tend not to have their phone on them because if they drop it, um, it's not free for it, things like that. Um, and then, of course, as we talked about on Monday, most of these high risk tasks that they're doing, uh, they're not by themselves anyway. They've got another team and sort of things like that with them. Um, they also have people at home. And as we talked about on Monday, that day, we talked about they're going out at night and things like that. So, um, yeah, so definitely we'll look to implement something like the get home safe thing, but it needs to be something that actually works um, in reality for the guys. So, working on that. Uh, chemicals, so, um, for instance, boringly. <coughs> uh, so, there's a whole bunch of reasons, reasons there. Um, I think we actually had one not too long ago, was a faulty regulator, I think. So, um, but the good thing is we've got a lot of uh, great, great team and great process in place. So, a lot of the we look like um, have the little um, shut-off valve, so as soon as they get the leak, um, they shut themselves off and things like that. So um, I think in my time, we've had a couple of little leaks when there's been changeovers and things like that, but nothing has ever been an issue because um, you know what they're doing and deal with the problem, which kind of itself is a pretty good um, win. Thank you, Chair. The shut-off valves on the... Um on the uh, sorry, the chlorine tanks are they mechanical or is that electrical operator valve? I'll probably throw it at these guys. So the, the emergency shutdown uh, um, yeah. valves, the power cut. How does that work? So it's very easy to say. No. Oh, they have to. Have that. Yeah, cool. Awesome. That's cool. Um, and so, in terms of an action there, um, getting all traffic staff uh, qualified to certify handlers, so um, those. Uh, pouring tanks, we saw the big ones in the picture earlier at Hamatangi, but obviously they also have the um, smaller bottles. Um, basically, to handle those, you have to be a certified handler. Um, I think uh, we've got about five people just about ready to go through and, and do that last step. Because again, that's quite a long process. Um, you have to do multiple um, different training days and things like that. So a few of them ready just to have their final, um, get somebody in to watch them and make sure that they're competent and get signed off, so um, that would make life a lot easier. But we've basically been pretty much a whole team can deal with that stuff, um, which yeah, just makes life easier. Um, who's, the, who's the certifying agency for that? In terms of who do we use? Yeah, who's, who's, who's the body that certifies? Well, it all comes under work safe, doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so we use is it has no signs off on our certified hand. Um, but I mean, basically, my understanding anyway, what I can find out for sure is that that's just all set as a requirement under the website um, that you need to be a certified handler to do the handling of the product. 
So is it, is it the EPA or the New Zealand Agrochemical Education Trust? That's the sort of where we're on. New Zealand so. New Zealand so. Process, so that's one that we can talk uh, about early. So that's good. <coughs> um, seven and eight around our training competency matrix and health monitoring processes. So that's sort of all we merge together. And again, it's the Jarvis one. So basically, the idea behind this is we just have a, um, a one area in Jarvis where everybody's uh, health and safety related health monitoring training stuff can go. So we, uh, it's just going to be easier for us to keep on top of when people are due for different things, especially um, now that. There does seem to be like with this STME stuff and all that, there's just different pieces expiring at so many different times. So it's, uh, that'll make life a lot easier. Uh, and sort of management. So uh, again, another Jarvis one. So this is quite cool in that uh, people who are out and about, so like our uh, pregnant and retic guys, uh, will actually just be able to quickly um, report incidents and new and stuff on their phones while they're out and about. So they're going to keep to a computer. So uh, that's a pretty upgrade and then lastly um, our communication with RDC shared services staff um, to be honest I'm talking with um, especially sort of the treatment guys that I have gone out with and run to you recently in Mel and that they don't seem to have as many issues as they maybe did when uh, plans first written and this was a goal um, and I think uh, from their feedback uh, the changes in RDC have made a big difference to them um, and so that's really cool, but um, we're still uh, having a chat with Sharon and Marcel over at RDC to see how we can um, get these things that we can smooth out and make it easier for uh, the people on the ground um, if they need to communicate with either of us about things. So, I think
You certainly have uh, diverse work in many sites and many places, um, uh, doing a complete range of things. Um, and it looks like there's really good plans in place for everyday operations. I wondered what plans you have in place for when we're in the rain conditions, say like 2004 weather event or whatever, is it 2015 weather event where, you know, the call center goes crazy and you're required to go all directions. Um, what, how, how do you manage, you know, a multiple incident call out? Um, first thing, yeah, if it's flooding and, and it's a weather event, um, straight away the team buddy up, they work together in pairs, whether it be risking going out on your own, um, happened in the 2015, um, the odd one got isolated, we, we learned from that, that uh, an RDC had happened. From that, so we study up um, where the, uh, the operators are sort of directed by myself and the priority spots are and where we can go and look and see and see what's happening with our asset. Uh, that's sort of how we deal with that. When you get like that happens, you know, Adam, where all our team are and what they're doing, pretty hot on that. They'll relay the issues back to myself or Adam, and then Adam will then relay it back to the DOC if there's any issues back. Yeah. <coughs> so, in, a, in an emergency event, um, and, and I guess subsequent to the 2015 event, we didn't have the, um, the, the, the get home safe in the case at that point. So, so we do have involvement protections for the teams when they're out and about working with them as buddies that they've got that sort of ability there plus the eros gives us a good track of where people are um, in an emergency event and i use for 2015 as an example it's, it's not business as usual because it's all hands to the pump literally um, and so what we typically do andrew lives in um, and so he would typically because it's, it's, if it's a weather event that's going to affect one or two it's probably going to affect you know, the bit as well and so it depends on what actually happens, but we'll separate the team out um, where, we, where we can. And so Adam lives in Wyvern, and he'll essentially have an oversight across the main two um, assets, and Andrew will sort of separate that out um, across the range of big assets. So it really is um, event specific, but we do have a level of, I guess, overlapping capacity to be able to separate the team out to manage the immediate uh, response. But I'll specifically to you, to your question, there, there are those same systems in place, plus the, the new systems that we've got for tracking where people are and the, the feedback loop um, in that sort of situation. One of the key things is information from the, from the field, so, so there's probably more communication happening at that time than there would be on a typical sort of weekend day. So we're pretty good feel on where people are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So What about in uh, extreme weather events like that where you can't be everywhere at once and then members of the public start, you know, farmers get out their tractors and diggers and start clearing stormwater issues and all that kind of thing. Has is, is that been an issue in the past? Manhole or not a manhole, but you know, you know, control it. Quite a few instances of that have broken stuff. But the other thing, too, is that we. <coughs> Sorry, what's your hand up all there, Carol? Yeah, no, I was just thinking of um, well, their safety as well. It's, I don't know. Are you cover members of the public when they yeah, we don't recommend it, but the good old farmer who, who wants to help the community out. Yeah. Sometimes it it helps. <laughs> it helps yeah. And sorry, where I was going before, we do we do have our known hotspots. And so even when you have a big event, it's not the scattering an approach everywhere. So you know response to it. 
Sorry, Grant, just the last third thing, which is just an observation. Brooke sent me Susie through some um, beautiful photos of the deep dive out of the, you know, the you see that the majority of the councillors um, that were there were taking a sun smart approach of wearing hats. Something that perhaps the council leaders can pick up and have a starting to pick up. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks for that. Just in terms of the uh, incident uh, report and incident management, um, are you are you using, and I may have missed this, are you using an app on the phone that goes to Clinton Jarvis? Uh, not yet, so that is where we're heading. Um, and that, there are already apps available, you know, like people say, use that sort of stuff. Yeah, we? but it, it doesn't, uh, one's the cost when we can actually build it in house, it's free. Yep. Um, but also, Getting it to interlink properly into our system. Um, so it's just the fact that we have the, the skills here to, to build it ourselves and build it exactly how we want it, um, then it makes like uh, that matters to do it that way. But we do, um, yeah. At the moment, it's just it is in Jarvis, but it's just the fact that you have to go, you have to use a computer. Um, so, so you're currently using a paper-based <coughs> paper-based system for uh, incident reporting. No, so it's it is electronic. So you go into Jarvis and it, it's just got the fields like filling out an electronic form ID. Um, it's, it's just the compatibility for some reason. As I said earlier, obviously IT is not my friend. Um, but yeah, it's uh, we, the new Jarvis upgrade will mean that instead of just doing it from a computer, you have to do it from your mobile phone and tablet. Um, so it's everything around the place accessible. So once you get that information, and of course near misses are the greatest learning tool you get. Um, um, do you do any analysis on uh, intentional and unintentional behaviour? And, and I'm sure you know, I, I would feel pretty confident that would be very little unintentional behaviour. Um, uh, to be honest, no, we don't do anything yeah. like that at the moment. Um, and yeah, I think if there's a problem, we would have Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Dom, do you have anything? Um, you can go. Okay, well, anyway, we'll move on. Right, well, look, thank you very much, um, team, for that. Um, Actually, he looks frozen. Actually, he looks frozen. I know. I used to see it. Probably because the phone wasn't coming through. Okay, you're still here, John? Yep. Anyway, we'll move on here. Thank you, Tate. Um, yeah, very good. Thank you, Brooke. Right, we'll move on. Uh, item 7.1. Um, I'll just report back to you. Thank you. Is it right? 
So, um, the annual report, much, much less than you'd ever expect because of our COVID impact. So, we would normally have adopted this on 30, 31st of October, but the timelines were pushed out by um, regulations through the 31st of September. So, audit week, ooh, we won't start you until November. So, they are arriving on Monday. Um, I didn't bother bringing this to you earlier because the longer we worked on it, the better it gets. And we're actually really focused on our water um, work that has been done and the other project work that's happened. So this is, um, it should say draft on the front, I notice it doesn't, but it is actually a draft because it hasn't been signed off. So this is a draft in the report. I've already found the first spelling error, that's bugged me. It's been through eight people to review and it still hides really easy spelling errors. You've got some as well. Oh, great. No, no, I they might be the same ones. I've got some duplications. So, um, a couple of key things in there. Ooh. Now, bearing in mind that when we, when I brought the report to you last audit and risk, it was the quarterly report, and that was reporting against the revised budget. And the thing that really stands out, of course, is CapEx. So, against the revised budget, we were only 52% um, complete, but against that, in the clean budget, we we're 113%, so we we're really good. Look, it was overhauled, but um, as you recall, due to the amount of work that came in, you've got the three waters over half the other bridge and carry forwards, anything else like that. We went up to a $60 million capex budget that we were working to, but your annual plan does not change. So, in your annual plan, we're sticking to the, to the published numbers that say we've got 113 and 753. It's got a very conflicting report that you get. Um, the, Operating surplus shown in the statement of comprehensive revenue expenditure. So, for the normal for you call that the bottom of the statement. Um, it's showing that we have a surplus of 8.3 mil against a budget deficit of 3.3. So, you'll think to yourself, we've got lots of surplus cash. But when you drill into that, you find that a lot of that cash is actually for capital revenue that's coming in for those capex projects that we were doing. So it's not cash that's unspent. If you jump to the statement of cash flow, you'll see that our bank only moved by around a million dollars difference. So it's not that we have eight mil of cash sitting in that spend. We spent the money we didn't have and then being spent on capex. Um, personal debt, the main divide on budget. Um, Council achieved 60 of our 72 performance measures, and you'll, as you go through, you'll see which ones they are. There are 14 where we couldn't, um, we didn't achieve them. A couple of ways of due to COVID, the library and the casino come to mind, where it's it's um, volume based, you know, people patronage, and because of restrictions, we couldn't get those through. Um, and there were two measures that were unable to be um, measured. One of those that comes to mind is the um, pools measure, which has been there since the last OTP, but has gone for this new OTP. And because it is in the OTP, we have to report against it and put it to announce what um, There were a couple of breaches in our investment policy um, because we had too much revenue <coughs> in our bank account for a, in a certain period at night. Um, BIA, probably, well, we could say BIA, please don't give us money tonight, we're going to have too much cash because we're losing our rates. But we didn't, we just took it, held it in um, overnight, and went down to the investment rates. So that's a cash flow management um, breach. I've listed there a um, investment being held with a bank other than our transactional bank. And you recall that we've made the call to kind of maximise our investments and put it with whichever bank gets the best interest rates. Um, with our existing um, regular financing and financing and liability policies and investment policies, for this report, there was some there was some quite tight criteria saying how much you would be spending on that. And our new LTP, we have new policies which give us more flexibility on the different things. Um, there is an explanation on page 136, which is not that outlines the key movements or the key variances um, to our budget. So we did have a good chunk of development contributions come in. I just want to say hooray, finally. Um, a little bit more than budget, but that's a bit of a drop in the ocean compared to what we've been spending in the next part. That's great that that's come through. Um, it also talks about the capital funding that we've received, because of course um, that's offsetting our revenue. Uh, depreciation, oh, and page on our certainly possibly comprehensive revenue expenditure. Councillor Stewart's probably be picking up is that 
We have a um, gain. Um, oh no, I'm thinking wrong before. We have a loss in this one, and that's showing we had to in here Armadale um, water plant and the centralization. So we have the assets and they're depreciating over a period of time, and their life was I'll say 30 years or something. We're replacing them, we're in the process of replacing them, we have to shorten their life to recognize that they run to the end of life earlier. So we've um, had to write them out to those time periods. So we've got those coming down, and then the going up value is the um, asset depreciations. So the three things go through that one cent, one account. One of the key things I wanted to walk you through, a bit of a speed date, but uh, any questions? Yes. Sorry, one of the things that really staggered me from about page six, which was talking about the numbers of the likes of building consents uh, and inspections, 6,700 and something or other building inspections for a 12 month period. It's just absolutely staggering. Mm -hmm. Control. Um, we have taken 90% 2020 rainings, so it's 8% of roughly 2% of the miles behind. Cancellations of inspections because the supply market has now shifted out. So the builders are booking an inspection, expecting their product to be there and the job to be done. Yeah. Um, and then when they realise that it's not going to happen, they're ringing up and cancelling. So, so there's a real pressurised system starting to bottleneck um, out there in that building trade. Yeah. So it's stuffing up our system as well. Yeah. Not that it's more than that. What they are doing is having something down, um, ringing in and booking four days. Or say, if I missed that day, then I've got that day, if I missed that day, it's actually clogging the system because they are reserving dates. So we missed that point. And then the fact that we're trying to pass the eye. Yeah, that was all of this. We're trying to assist them. But what we're doing, well, what we do is we take a list of on your inspection, and as the cancellations come through, we ring them up and we put the inspection. So, we do the yeah. Yeah. so, um, it's like a yeah. same thing on uh, page 57 to do with um, the discussion of season because we're following up from the main workshop. Uh, it's the start of the shift. Um, Take of 95% completion. 
Um, that's that's been amended because that's a quirk in the legislation as well. Because of the non cost rates and the short period. Well, so is it ninety five under this because we could we could change the change. Page eight. That's to do with a similar topic, really. The regulatory group um, uh, notes the LTP had a starting budget of 2.2 million, currently expected 1.1, so we're way at the start there. Um, and external charges, no internal charges made. True reliance on opening accounts is down, but just to push the cost of. Does but all of those external resources that we buy and see the cost here, we're not seeing them be on cost um, because they will be on cost of the energy. Um, so it's seventy three. And this time the sewage outflows um, the target was this by the house, but we that's one of these ones we were measuring it <coughs> properly. Um, so it's, it's not an accurate reflection of the actual, but in terms of the, the data that we had. Um, if you look at the, the water, Absolutely excellent. Uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that water. <laughs> and uh, I think the other council can be very proud of those, um, those results. Um, if I could comment on that, Mr. Chair. I mean, we had um, Andrew Van Dusten and Adam Jameson um, in here this morning, uh, but those, those two individuals know more about water and most of the treatment than we uh, know. The compliance of the drinking water standards um, and the, the myriad of requirements for testing and sampling and, and what is the best mean for those guys. Um, and it is a good, a really good system. <coughs> um, yeah, uh, the protozoa compliance in terms of the uh, Calcum Stanway scheme, which is non compliant, although we know that. And so our, our metric does reflect that because it's an unachievable target. But that is one of the the projects we have allocated some of the uh, GAA money to do. Yeah. Uh, just, just while we're on the drinking water, I'm going to check just how we can deal with other challenges around the place as far as water consumption. Yeah, just it's, it's, it's how many hours we drink. Sorry? It's, it's how many hours we drink for two. No, it's and the one above it, because I, I hope you don't spend okay. 16 hours hearing a complaint. I'm, I'm picking up the off on the cast, and I hope the word cast whilst focusing on that. So that's supposed to be linked to the um, In response to the question, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have a full breakdown of everyone else's um, I could, I could source that from 
on the heater to run at ROI or from the drinking water instances, most of the nationwide for the Ministry of Health, and you can bring it back to Lincolnshire at the focus group for interest. But bottom line. Oh, well, the only comment was on the fact that we don't have any water restrictions. I was just seeing mm -hmm. how um, our water usage compares with some of the others that do, but, uh, in which case, this is something that we need to look I was just wondering if um, you are able to comment on RDC. I mean, we're similar, we're the same staff, but um, you know, the governance decisions differ. What specifically would you like to what well, I was just that you know we have invested yeah. well. Um, they probably haven't as best invested so ring it anywhere near what we have. Bring it to get district council in their long term plan. Their, their new long term plan. About to, is it about two hundred and twenty million? Like they've got massive investment. Uh, they've got eleven. They've got eleven million dollars dedicated for the Martin water supply, which is their main, obviously their main town and their main supplier. Um, I, I guess the comparison would be that that this council invested back in the nineties for the new falls um, new line camera line, which are camera which are part of our um, key part of our infrastructure. Um, Martin, as an example, has relied on their town banks. They've got other smaller bores which are probably less, less than ideal. So, so they have allocated funds for investment, but it's a different water source which comes with its own challenges for treatment. A lot more exposed to the environment in terms of things outside of our immediate control. So all the post taste and odor issues that they've had in Martin, for example, have been as a result of uh, the raw water source and the fact that you, you, you've got a variable water source, which means you need to have quite a manual uh, treatment of it. Sorry, I might have been thinking of their overall LTP investment forward profile, which is quite significant. Yeah, they've got $25 million in their LTP for the Bulls Martin wastewater, $30 million for the Bulls Martin, uh, Martin water supply. Other capital investments in terms of civic facilities and therapy and um, Martin. That's obviously part of the equation that they need to balance in terms of prioritization investment. So what they haven't done in the past, they've certainly got the budgets for that. The subsidies and grants um, that were received was well above budget it made a mention of that in the big card um the wide was couple of uh, capital grants received that was just like what's so we have about the ten thousand dollars yeah um also got the Bridge and all of that was reasonably budget. Page fifty three. Um, oh yeah, um, yeah, but it was good. Uh, not measuring the um the triangle fix to Resolutions and uh, targets less than five hours, actual six months to three months. Yeah, I think all the information has been rectified in the LTP. Yeah. Yeah. Um, page one, two, seven. Internal account to Amanda events after the balance date says not aware of the events, but uh, note 36 has got a detailed report about COVID. Um, yeah, um, so yeah, from the COVID in the takes the media of this, and it's also going to have effects. It does, but that's important this year, but it's not the impact on this year has not been determined. We're still continuing, we're still continuing at this stage to operate. Numbers are slightly down in line with the but not financially significant. Um, we would normally put something in here like if we had a, there was a flood event in July, we would put that all through and make sure that that can be put in. But the financial impact on, um, on COVID so far has, has been minimal. We can't. <laughs> um, 
six. Um, oh yeah, that's where you can explain appearances, that's all good. Um, last point uh, on page uh, 147, actually with that race for the race the rates increase every time more. Yeah, so as you recall, we, didn't put the rates up. we didn't put the rates up, but that was we didn't put the rates up because we put growth out of it. Yeah. So we actually just put them down, but we just didn't grow even. So when you put the rates increase that you're budgeting less growth, then actually the slightly negative percentage. So that green is dollar, total dollars per year. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm just swapping. The housekeeping one, page 21, perhaps um, Hamish might comment on that one. It's the um, chart for the four wheel bands. Um, I would have thought stormwater would have had cu cultural implications. It's not ticked. Well, it's exactly the same chart. We used to be able to I had the oh, same thought because yeah. both <laughs> most the same. I've circled them both and gone. Yeah, I they have cultural sure implications. I can, um, follow that up with well, it's, it's water, so yeah. I would imagine it is. Yeah, absolutely. That's fine. I know we, we use Australia as well to take the application. Sorry, I didn't pick it up there. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I do can I have picked up a couple of double ups and errors which I'm happy to pass on, but the one that I wanted to touch on was page 65 and it was in relation to delivery of the waste education programs and I was just interested in the rationale around that being achieved because we've chosen to focus on Enviro schools and the schools in the zero waste um, program um, but actually um, the initial um, commitment in that space included a whole farm um, waste program which hasn't been implemented and so I was just keen to um, check in as to um, you know, it, where something was proposed and actually hasn't happened, you know, can we genuinely say that we've 100% achieved? Um, through you, Mr. Chair, I mean, the, the measure there is, is largely around the Borough Schools program. It was, it was referenced and previously consulted on waste education, but uh, rural waste education. It was, it was a small amount done, but not, not as much as falls with the Borough Schools program. Um, it's probably been something that we would have to specifically turn for so it's a bit of what we but um to the to the uh, to the the, the new rate waste minimization plan um it's certainly where that we could add more um, but in terms of the measures and how we achieve all the most components zero waste and more schools we can achieve that and fund it appropriately well, I guess I'm just looking at the, the measurement, talking specifically about working with farmers to encourage them. You know, it sounds like we've, I mean, you can tick it off and say you've achieved it, but it sounds like it's been an absolute bare minimum. Um, you know, so, yeah. Um, I do have, did have one other comment, but it's in relation to the, the cover report as opposed to the report itself. So I'm happy to just hold that until the end. I, it was um, just um, picking up, I contacted Shane yesterday, you know, we got a draft cover report, um, which, you know, had highlights, you know, section 3.6 on, it's all in highlighting, you know, clearly half written, ready to come back and, and lock some details in. So I just wanted to pick up with you, Shane, from an internal, you know, and quality, quality con, um, assurance and control process, um, you know, how did that get through like that? Um, yeah, that's exactly what our question is because otherwise we'd be picked up the chairs in terms of the report I had written from home and sort of saying that the draft sets out the home spot and it comes through, it goes through from me, it goes through um, Ali a lot of the time, or Steve, it goes mm. to the chairs meeting, but probably because there is all of this document as well, and people that I suspect that were picked with none of us have picked up. Mm. Covering report, read through that, and then go to the 
Well, that hence the question. I was really surprised to see it get through on the basis of conversations that we've had and understanding how the system works. Um, John, do you have anything you want to add? Yeah, I no, not on the annual report. I think it's all been explained. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Just a little bit interested in the remainder in the, in the half a million dollars um, um, tax loss that half in contractors heads, and and uh, whether or not there's any way um, that you can circumnavigate anything to actually really pluck that back out of just sitting at a big hole. So um, it's a very it's really low that I'll um, bring to you now. And to keep that because you never know what you might want to do with it, um, we as a whole don't pay tax. It's, it's sitting there. So, for instance, um, discussions have been if we were to go down the path of the community could we utilise that entity? At one stage, there was discussions about utilising that, that entity and equal those losses when we were thinking about the plastics um, project. So, it's, it's kind of sitting there for us to go, we could use it in the well, how far do you take advantage of the tax credits? Some stage of credits. Um, short term project used to be a tax loss to tax priority. They'd probably come back into that. They'd ask to do it now, but yeah, it might be a way. I'd like to do this. We've got it forward. All right, cheers. We're good. Any more questions on the annual report? <clears throat> Not as a resolution, I'll pay you a shout out to I'm just taking advice. You can read it as it as it stands. You don't need to make any amendments. Are that order risk committee recommends that the council receive the annual draft and the report for the year ending 30th of June 2021. With the mayor and chief executive delegated authority to make any minor changes requested by Order New Zealand and sign the statement of compliance and responsibility for its contained within the annual report or the year ending 30th of June 2020. I'll just one general comment too about comps. I said to a wish the other day, I noticed a uh, presentation, video presentation that Hastings Council had done, which was particularly excellent. Uh, about communicating the one uh, process and a written end report, which you want to publish. Secondly, how does get the message out there about what we've done? Last year, highlighting all the good stuff. Um, so, any plans around communicating um, what's publicised in the annual report? Um, you know, no, I can't say here. I mean, we published the annual report, but within a month of the adoption, we also have to publish a summary, which is more like the fifth. The, yeah. Um, and it's in the summer of the season. Um, but I know these videos that your worship does, um, which does wind ups of one summaries of council meetings. I'm not sure what the might be the plans, or you think it's something that will work. Well, I just want to refer you, well, perhaps a worship department, um, uh, have a look at that. Hastings one is a I do. Okay, we've got six point two quarterly performance reports. Thirty September. Right. 
Yeah. 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 So um, the court report will do the first of September. One of the key things that has occurred at this stage is the revaluation of assets. So I just kind of have that in your mind. So depreciation is looking um, quite low because of our revaluation of assets is in the process of being done. Um, the reason why it's a bit behind is that Audit New Zealand haven't yet finished auditing last year's revaluation. So a little reluctant for the team to require ahead of this year's and um, so that will be more as soon as audit is signed off, we'll be bringing you the emails for this year. Um, currently, our statement of contents of value is $4 million against the revised surplus of Omicron 2. Our VCs are looking good again. They come in when they come in, but they're looking um, good against budget. Um, our other revenue is looking unfavorable due to RBC and so what we're saying here is it's not that they haven't paid, it's more that we've had some vacancies, we haven't done the work to get this stage, and therefore at this stage we haven't done to invoice them. Um, so as the work progresses, the invoice is very much kind of a feed to this kind of arrangement. Um, personal costs are favourable. I don't think there's probably any surprises. We've got some pretty large vacancies, um, particularly the regular we have got the GMs around the there's a um, favorable sitting in your operating expense. There's a bit of maintenance that hasn't yet happened. Um, disposal costs down a bit. There's, there's bits and pieces as we go through the report. I think you probably um, one of the main things is capital expenditure. We're at six point six actually physically paid out the door before I think we were paging. However, um, if you add that up with our commitments, those are the things we've actually got contracts. We've done the we've done the purchasing. It's in the pipeline. We're looking um, at 23 now, which is what we want. There are a couple of levels of service and regulatory that were brought in for the new LTP, um, and the reporting for those has yet been finalised. Um, it's a bit of a runaround trying to fix that up. They've got the information, but it's actually just sourcing it for them that um, we're able to report. So that will be remedied by the next year. It's fine, Bob. Um, so if you go on to page 20, I think it is, I can say my report, but page 20, you can see the key, um, key points indicator showing two um, measures that are unmet, not met. Those are the library and the swimming pool, based on their number of impacts, um, patron turned down. Um, it's only one quarter, and it's not the sum of the two. So we've got the big pool open, so we have that plan. Um, so, yeah. I'm not sure we've got all that concerned about the page at this stage. And relevant to the shut. Yeah. Um, statement of comprehensive revenue expenditure with your, your PL license, which is page 41. We've got a gain there of 806,000. That's it right at the bottom, it kind of stands out. Um, we budget for a gain, but not for this. So the budgeted gain was um, for the revaluation movement. And that doesn't occur yet. So the gain that you can see here is the gain we made on Bowling Street, which sounds really strange because we sold it for its book value, but it had revaluation attached to it in the way that we can see. But we actually received exactly like the So um, I haven't really written any notes around the funding impact statement because a lot of um, this is actually explained as you go through each of the activities. Um, the statement of financial position. Um, much to talk about in here. Um, but then into the activity statements, is, is, is kind of where the, the meat is. So if we're looking in the community facilities, you can see the impact in the, um, the library with the higher revenue. You'll recall they had two additional positions that come from externally um, in running particular programs. Those finished this year, but we do still have that. So we have two people and the additional revenue. So we need to pick up staff costs and all that sort of things. Um, the one that comes to mind, the Kino, you can see that the patronage is down. The costs are also down. They've got some you know, vacancy issues in there, finding the team, finding the staff. Yes, they do. So um, there's a bit of an offset there as well. That's probably the two things on the, on the community facilities that I thought I'd mention. Um, the cemeteries are in New Zealand. I didn't think we should go out and try and um, get additional patronage of here. It'll come as it comes. Um, 
Delta's coming. So in the regulatory saying, we're looking, I mean, no surprises here, the building control costs are much higher than expected around 50, 60, 60, 60, day. Thanks to consultants. You will see there is a revenue increase there, higher than budget as well, as we're starting to recover those. Um, environmental health, slightly below, we've done some invoicing yet, uh, but also slightly below on cost. So they mean on budget, you know, kind of nothing to see here at this stage. Um, the planning, the consent and district planning, that should just say consent planning now. The district plan isn't in there, so that's a bit more information about this is straight consent planning. This is the team dealing with the consents. Um, so they have got additional revenue into the volumes of consent and consent to and that annual report is high. Um, usually the costs are high, but you know they're, they're looking okay at the stage when it comes to a more current revenue as it's been a chair. That's because the number of consents have gone up. So we have a consent fee price. If we get more consents, there's more people paying that price. Right. And for our costs are going up because we're using more consulting more staff up to make it to process those consents. So in that area, it's consented quite straightforward. We get additional consents. Yeah, which costs consent? Yeah, I know, I'm sorry, I'm not sure on that. Yeah, it's only yeah, yeah, yeah. the planning area that we have. Most of what we start with the general consent. Some of those have worked out and didn't. Uh, so we had to bring that work back in and register it all. Consultants that we're working. That was going to be my question. Do you see it improving? Um, well, I see it improving in terms of the, the quality of the consultants we're having. So, hopefully, we're Do you think when borders are more freely open that there'll be more opportunity for local government in general to get overseas? Um, it's very difficult because our RMA and planning is uh, very different. Canada was close. Uh, Canada's a building. That's much yeah. England's pretty close. Uh, we have Sydney especially has done a number of trips to Over into infrastructure. Infrastructure is the majority of development contribution in New Zealand. It's of course the borders are promoting and so little bits of security. So um, the revenue in the year is contributing 277,000 favourable as from development contributions. Um, there are a lot of transfer station gate takings, depreciations around the rebounds. This is the area that we do the rebounds in annually. So the infrastructure rebounds, this is the, the particular area that we get, get the below budget clearance for Sydney for now. 
um, and the lower maintenance across various things. And we don't maintain because the budget says do it oneself as it is required. So more timing seems to be coming through that conversation across there. We'll note that the nursery is still split out. It sits under wastewater and it's split out. And it's revenue was higher than budget. Its cost is slightly higher than budget. And it lands within 4K on budget. That's the big benefit right now. Um, on to support services, we've got um, a very secure, it's the very first one's infrastructure support, looks looks ugly, you know, as you're looking in there. So as I mentioned before, this is predominantly the um, Rangitaki District Council Shared Services contract. Um, work hasn't been done as much for the Inverted Staff Agency, and maybe we could throw in the work, we haven't invoiced it. So it's good, it is a zero um, effect on our account, we budget for revenue and expenditure. If one's up, we invoice it. If it's not up, we won't invoice it. So, um, zero effects as such. It just shows us turbulence lines. Across this area, which is the support service, this is the people's. This is the, the budgets that have the people in it. Um, they're allocated out by timesheet or by overheads to those other areas that we do not So, predominantly, the underspend appearances in the expenditure in here is predominantly vacancies or training or people related costs, predominantly. Um, yeah, uh, the one that stands out here is emergency management. At the moment, it's showing, and I say at the moment, it's showing unfavorable budget by 144,000. This is reflecting 146, 147 of it is reflecting the costs that have been allocated due to the COVID um, response. Now, we've just recently reviewed that, and we're going to be doing some work around that because it seems like a little bit of a um, People when they're doing their timesheets, they've gone, oh, I had a bit of downtime today, that's because of COVID, I'm going to stick it to the coach. Um, so we we're going to be changed, expected. Which we're going to be fixing, we <laughs> sat down the hammer last night, we took this one side for a rubbish. Um, so we'll be fixing that to be back to the places. Um, there is real cost in here, you know, the need field response is in here. Um, we know the people that work here, we know the hours they work, so we will be looking at anybody that doesn't fit that roster. Um, there was an ability for um, staff to code to this code when they were in lockdown for that period of time, if they were at home and actually unable to work, then we did want it coded to us. We did want to recognise it's during COVID, um, but not just because we might have had a half hour time and thought, sure, sure, we'll just code it. Um, so, not a, not a thing. so this will change. We'll go there. Um, what's the next page? Next page is CapEx. I'm not going, I'll just leave this for you to. To ask questions about because I did not scroll through all of that. Um, a question to Council, uh, a comment to Councillor Hillary. I read in the minutes that we've said we're going to go into facts and trend reporting for these levels of service, and we haven't done that yet. The team are partway through building it, and then they realised that the levels of service for this year were not exactly the same. The change, the previous yeah. years. So um, you can probably only baseline and trend on a three yearly period, and so then some of them yeah. we can trend, and others we won't. So um, just tidying that piece of work up. Um, when they got into the degree, they kind of went, oh, I didn't see that quite work like I thought. And then flipping over to accounts receivable and accounts um, outstanding rates. Um, current year outstanding rates are a little bit higher. Not too worried about that because, of course, we're doing the adjustment. So that will come down and we won't charge any penalties. I'm not too worried about that at this stage. And also, um, you know, with the lockdown, I think some people did have plays come in. Not too many, to be fair. A lot of our a lot of our payment was on time, so that's good. Um, you've got a list of your of our debt, um, where it sits. Um, and, oh, look, and the book that I, I, I like, I guess I do really like, is page 39. This is keeping a track of um, the movement between what we publish in the annual plan and what our revised budget is. So the difference, um, we report against the revised but of course the annual plan, you can see what that will look like at the end. Um, after that, we've got health and safety report, which I'll leave for Brooke to comment on. And then we've got the Treasury, the Bank of Treasury report. So, questions? Yeah, look, um, as Chair of um, Community Development, I was quite intrigued to see on your variation um, the Chief Executive approved item. The Garden Festival funds, um, a, a contribution of $15,000 funded from special reserves and um, uh, th that was completely un out of the blue or no, not something, that, so I just wanted to check in and about that. Do you know what page that is? Um, 
Yeah. It's page 39 or 22 of 23, depending on what you're looking at. So at, at community development, um, we are aware of a delegated um, uh, authority decision, totally outside policy, but that's what it, it is what it is, um, in terms of the New Zealand House and Garden Tour, but that was only $10,000 and it's been funded from community development funds. So I'm like, well, where's the $15,000 and why is it coming from special reserves? Well, I don't know. I'm wondering if that's an error and it's supposed to be 10,000 and it's not from reserves, it's from oh, community it's development. 15 I was opposed to North America. It's the, when the garden festival wound up, they gave council a contribution of money and it is to be used for a specific project and it has now been used and I'm just wrecking my brain. And it sits in the fund. Yeah, right. it's, 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 it's the amount of money that was given to council to use. I think it's something to do with Timona Park. It's to, it was to be used for a, a garden, you know, um, parks related uh, project. And I do recall the team um, explaining that. Oh, that was the needs of the council garden. Yes, so the up. funds yeah. came, right. were donated to council to use for a specific project. Yeah. Do you recall that one? <laughs> Still drawing a blank. So it's a special Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarification because it did. It, it was an odd one to me. Have you got any other money hiding around? Like that? <laughs> yes. I want to know. Have you have you looked at what's sitting in the general reserves and the reserves and the parks one? And there's a few bits of pots I'd like to get my hands on. So we did do a bit of a look at those reserves when we were doing the RTP. slide change of direction if I may. Uh, page 29, under Rudy, uh, subsidised site facilities, looking at the consent application software across the top of the screen, which we've watched but awaiting EV approval. Just looking for this bit more background on that if I can. Uh, for you Mr Chair, so um, there's a similar, similar consent process that we have to go through for anything that involves mm -hmm. a waterway. Um, the actual construction doesn't bring in near the waterway, it's the button on the side. Uh, we have met and I have senior representatives of maybe co Yeah. Uh, So there are three other members that need to be engaged with as part of the process, and they will refer back to Kofola as, as they typically do. You understand that process. When was that, um, when was that actually lodged with EU for, for comment? Uh, Chair, quite interesting. Uh, as I was driving to the airfield a, a few weeks ago, I noticed a whole lot of Kiwi Rail trucks uh, nicely parked on the Nashville um, uh, and, and using it for. For, for their purpose, which I thought was actually quite uh, quite intriguing. Did you take a photo? Oh, well, I should have taken a photo, actually, but I didn't know.
was only on, on that slide away. Yeah. Yeah. Flash. Thanks. Through the chair, just a couple of very light questions. Um, page 28 under the property, Banfield Park Development. You see we've got um, 287 codes in there, breaking down the way, crossing the way for the next three months. Clarification on what that was for. Just on a comment, please, on the motor vehicle renewals. Um, and why that's jumped from 361 to 796 due to the many other jumps that we've had um, uh, to bring budget forward or reallocating the vehicles that have been pretty accurately um, programmed in. And just why was that big jump there? Deliberately didn't replace a lot of vehicles last year because we had vehicles. Our policy works um, with um, two things. One is um, four years, or there's a case um, for replacement. Um, we were getting vehicles that had done four years, but had only done 85,000 cases. Um, and um, so I said, we're not selling those. If we can go to five years, 100,000 cases, the return on the net is sort of sales about the same. And uh, a lot of it was due to vehicles being locked up and not being used for a large part of the year with COVID lockdowns and that. So we carried the renewal money from last year and put it into this year. And even now, we're not going to replace all the vehicles we're scheduled to because we can't keep them. So we've pushed back some of this budget for possibly next year. And next year. year. And, yeah. and look, a vehicle now running up, our thing, our policy is 100 Okay, that's not large case for vehicle, and even if that, a lot of our vehicles are diesel, uh, even at 200 k, that's not large case for vehicle. So we're just trying to sweep them a little bit. Not at this um, stage, so you're referring back to me tomorrow on this year's presentation. We've got quite good cost of interest um, because we've, we've benefited from this. Quite a Some of those are locked at mm -hmm. what's saying for a period of time. Yeah, all, all of them are locked for a year. We have um, initial papers about 11 and a half mil, so a six and a half to five and a half. It rolls on a six, about a six month cycle. It's taken up to 11 to interest rates. Um, and so that kind of helps the bank with interest. Did you actually just change that time? Um, no, but so the interest rate is floating even though the term is fixed. So if you like, if you get a package mortgage and you can take that um, a floating rate for a fixed rate, um, it's for a period of time, so they're actually fixed and they're not actually making sure to the date, but the interest rate. So what's the effect of the um, second installment? Oh, sorry, but it drops back. So, yeah, um, so the, the annual fee, it will come back closer to the end budget. It might even be back in the end budget. Well, we don't know. 80, 90 K is kind of where it sits, depending on what happens about penalties and all those things. Yeah, so that's what it's like. Well, it's first of all, the surplus is probably what it plays in that one now. Lower. Just if I may, on the um, on the seventy four k for the field and little theatre feasibility study, just wondering how we spent seventy four k just covering that the walls were on. Um, yeah. 
big size of execution. Um, you'll see more in line with how we are approaching the computer, and they are actual prices received. So we've got a uh, recommendation on the page which is now thing. So the Board of Fresh Credit Member of the Council of Seas and Board of Fresh Credit Board. Yeah, uh, Fresh Credit Discussion with the motion. There's a vote. Aye. 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 Right, I can see for three in turn order that way. So um, this is really is just an update. Everything from the previous minutes and thoughts is not an awful lot really to still tell you, other than we are we have the um, two projects that are two audits that are kicking off. I have set them up for the January um, period because we have audits starting this week and it's going to be enough to put me on Christmas. So um, we have Colin Kelly Slit undertaking a expensive <coughs> expenditure policy review. Um, it's something that's Popped up in our last annual report um, from um, audit, saying that our policy plan was very tough and we need to be tweaking and look at it. So, as part of that, we thought, well, it's actually good to go and do an audit of the actual spending pages that will have errors that we'll have them look at. Um, at this stage, I'm wanting them to focus on the new purchase paths because they easily are able to look on the board kind of area because we'll be more on track towards 2015. Um, disposal of council assets, which is the process we're run. Can't see those two, but there's zero at least four out of the six of expenditure policy that they'll be covering a very cheap order of about three thousand dollars and not particularly big, it's not particularly large area to look at. Um, the chunky audit is our um, GST FPT audit. Um, so I contacted both PwC and Deloitte's Deloitte's came back with a half the price of PwC. And they have just recently worked with the IRD to get an agreement that if they do, they've worked out a work program for the audits, that if they do this type of audit and the IRD pick us as a person of interest, of interest they will take the audit, guys up, check it, and look no further. So it will say that's a lot of ease that we be picked as such. So um, I've just had them come back with the work scope and they said you can do the right time and we can do the approved one and I went to the general IRD. One, you don't want to go down this path of looking at it again because you'll be picked. Um, you can decide what I did that. Well, Jeff, it seems the expenditure policy will be one person to look at frequently because it does cover, uh, does cover things like staff travel, um, staff expenses when they're away at the meetings, what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. Um, so there are a lot of things in that sense of expenditure that are. Exactly that, specific sensitive expenditures. So <coughs> that's the run up, um, but in order to throw it every couple of years, it's a pretty good thing. It's just that way. Because at the end of the day, if someone goes out and spends a bucks to do it, then that's a long time away. It's quite a lot of time. We have a duty that I often sit on the um, item that we are talking about that under the but it's more about making sure that the excellent person is coming. Um, this sits with the new union corporate. Um, just, to, just to confirm, this could, there will be so near all expenditure that goes through some sort of policy. It has to meet all, all credit to add to that. Insured that uh, the 150 on the bill would have enjoyed it. It's not a meal, it's why it goes with it. Uh, it's a different policy. Yeah. Okay, we have the that and the that or else is there anything in particular that you think those numbers uh, should be the target of the meal? <coughs>
It's a good point. Usually, um, we would have formed this through the management report. But then the report hasn't even been audited yet, let alone the management report. So it may well be next year that once we have that report, we'll bring back some amendments to the program that we've highlighted. Right, uh, the general order program I've done. No, I didn't notice. I opened my laptop from there, but I did notice in my health and safety report there was not burnout in there. Considering I've just sent an email to the CEO and head of the department to round this burnout to round my reserve, I think it's not. <laughs> no, um, Francis does a marvellous job and at just briefing some of those stats together. <coughs> Yeah. Well, I said I actually rang one 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 the other night, and um, yeah, the police told me there was been no problems in place because it was around my reserve, and I'd be able to catch everybody. An hour and a half later, they're still listening to me. It's going. We actually drove through and took photos. Yes, we've got an intersection at Airway, which <clears> seems to be popular at the moment. I never hear them, it's only about three k's away, but it, it's been so bad the last couple of times. So can have come through with a sweeper to get the rubber off the road. They were actually, so they were actually just sitting, burning out until it blew, but they drove right through the car seat of the grandma. Very good, thank you for that. So, just really picking up on what Francis was saying, updates in terms of our overall sort of um, COVID response and vaccine and updates. So, probably the biggest one that would follow coming out from the government guidance, and we're very much taking a, a follow the lead from others as opposed to blazing a trail of how this might happen in local government. So the government's been talking around public health orders around education and uh, sort of stuff. So the biggest focus for us has been around what they call the EOTC, education outside the classroom. And so from the council point of view, we're looking very much at the, the interaction with the public and children, if you like, um, in, a, in the context of the pool in the library. Um, and we've gone through a process of identifying who else might be in that space. So emergency management officers and our people in culture team, um, as well as our common staff. So on the basis of that, um, 45 staff have been issued with a public health letter, um, sorry, issued, issued with a letter under the basis of that, um, essentially requiring the same vaccine uh, education, et cetera. So that's a piece of work that's been, been ongoing. Um, in addition to that, we've also, um, Francis and the team have put together a survey for all staff, um, just basically asking them to disclose their vaccination status. We've hesitated to do it for privacy reasons up until fairly recently. Um, I guess the government guidance has evolved um, regularly and quickly. Um, so we haven't done that, we now have, and we're confident in that. So, so of that, we've had 99 people out of 100, sorry, we've had 128 staff that have responded out of a full-time staff of 100 and plus the part-times and casual spaces of about 200. Um, so we've had uh, 99 people have indicated that they are fully double vaccinated. 
So they have one person that said that they don't not want to get vaccinated, but they will if they're going to get the shot. Um, and then they have five people who have said that they have decided to do it. And I mean, the remainder of the team uh, have not responded. Uh, so the remainder of people that have responded have had their first jab and came on as the second. And we're waiting for around about 60 staff that have been able to respond. Uh, and they've been asked to do so by the end of this month. I, I do know that elected members will see that uh, see that as well. <laughs> so, so essentially, that's the first step in terms of where the government guidance is going in the education space and how it applies. There's also a bunch of further sector work going on around the wider public sector and the wider local government space. So essentially, NB have got a, um, a framework for um, putting together a risk assessment um, for specific roles and across the government in that. So over and above the, the, the roles and the areas of work that I mentioned before, we're doing a risk assessment approach through other parts um, of the council. Um, and, and I guess whilst doing that, keeping one eye on the guidance coming out of, essentially out of Wellington through the Ministry of Health around whether a, a COVID, COVID vaccine mandate is coming our way or available to us. Um, so it's, that guidance is, is evolving. Doing everything we can within the guidance and, and uh, rules that are on the table at the moment. Okay. Yeah. Take questions, I'll answer what I can. What can I pick up with you? Survey. Yeah. All right, thank you very much. Um, right, I'd take consideration of a late item for the evening, um, item 11, note of application of items for the risk register now. Um, <coughs> raise the Yes, well, just given that we're looking at a level of um, certainty, and you know, in terms of the current government, you know, mandating that, although the specifics, obviously, um, from the from the feedback that's come through from the sector in terms of governance and um, EWE and involvement and all those kind of cre um, critical pinch points have yet to be um, worked through by the new steering group, but just actually that it creates some, um, you know, heightens the level of risk and creates a whole lot of flow and implications. And so just flagging it is something, you know, we had some initial discussion, you know, um, but we didn't do a substantive, um, you know, document a substantive um, implications assessment because there was so much um, moving. And so I guess it's just flagging that it would be, um, appropriate to put that on the agenda, I think, at some stage, although it may, again, this may be fractionally too early, it may be better just to hold off until the steering group has has worked through and you've got, you know, final things, but I think it is something that, that you know, it's going to have massive implications, so it needs to come back in terms of fully understanding those. Yeah, that's right. That's right. It definitely is in my mind. Yeah. <coughs> about the wider implications that the council might see. Right, uh, probably a little early to be able to do that. Uh, but 
just based on um, good guidance is due out to the centre. Well, notification of the to next meeting. Um, going back to the room, uh, yeah, I'm happy to speak to and discuss that. Everyone wants to speak to her on that. No, just I was really disappointed, you know, that having been pretty explicit at the last meeting um, about the fact that it was overdue and, you know, allowing, you know, trying to be fair and reasonable and not expecting you to <laughs> pull something out of your pockets and in two weeks, that three months later, there's been zero progress. Yeah. Oh, so, um, yeah, I don't think even to the minutes this morning, um, I'll be honest, it wasn't uh, so if that's been missed. Uh, yeah. yeah, look, I think for me, the broader issue is um, some of the workflow stuff that I've, t I've raised before in terms of, you know, I, at, at a wider level, items being raised or identified and then that not following through and I know that you've talked about there being some systems that need to be updated in, in terms of your ERP for workflows and stuff but I think yeah just just acknowledging a frustration that there does seem to be a pattern. Um, through Mr. Chair, what I'd, I'd just probably ask the, the committee um, and make a suggestion um, in terms of updating the work of Chairman Tolkien, um, we can do a ton of work and bring it back to, to Council for, for the committee for consideration. What I'd like to propose is possibly a workshop on it to actually get a steer from the, the wider council as to what changes they would like to see implemented. Because the current policy, it seems to stop the introductory team does a lot of work. Um, the current policy is actually not really enabling a bit to do. And so I don't want to do a review which is just change the date and put it back in front of you. So we can get a range of changes suggested. So I'd like to, to maybe test it in a workshop environment as to, as to what changes the, the wider council would like to see made, and then we can go away and look at it together. Uh, whether we can do that workshop review uh, in addition for the team in general, uh, that's a slightly different opinion, but um, that would be my, my um, request. Yeah, I mean, I'm keen for open workshops, but I have been for a long time, so. <laughs> well, um, other items for future meetings, um, surprising other the complaints issue we get. The Auditor General has just uh, about 10 days ago released a new report on risk management practices recommended for local authorities. Uh, and um, while we've still got some internal review to do of that report, just because it's fresh, um, it would be probably handy at the next meeting to just provide an update on, on what those practices are so that can actually inform the Audit and Risk Committee's approach. Um, in terms of some of its key recommendations, even at you know, just reading it, um, we've got some things in place, like in this committee and all of that, um, including risk appetite and decision making is on there. And probably one of the key ones is councils making sure that climate risk is included explicitly in decision making. Right, that's the
Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Is it John? Is it still there? Yeah, 